All right, we got a lot of ground to cover today, so let's hit the ground running. Uh, it's my last chance, my last crack at Revelation, so, but I'm going to stay uh, restricted to Revelation 16 because there's plenty there. So let's, uh, well, let's, let's, you know, I'm not sure you've had time to read or you will have time, so uh, what I've done is put the whole passage up. It's long, but uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile for us to look at. And as we started uh, four or five weeks ago, let's read this together. So let's look at Revelation 16 and uh, let's read this out loud together. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it turned into blood like that of a dead person, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, you are just in these judgments, O Holy One, you who are and who were, for they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, <clears throat> and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. Now the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they had refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to, to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. <clears throat> they are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on people and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. The title of my message this morning is Heavenly Bowling. Let's pray. Father. We uh, thank you for your word. We pray now for a miracle of speech, miracle of hearing, and also that we may partner with you in this whole exercise that a miracle may take place and we would hear from you today. We surrender ourselves, all of us, for that purpose, and we look unto you to help us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And as we delve into God's word, may the Lord be with you. Now, the point I would like you to remember out of this chapter for today is that sin released the wrath of God. But in Christ, a believer is not under wrath, but under God's grace and protection. And if I may add one sentence to that, your response to the wrath that is and is to come is be ready. Now let's dive right in because we've got a lot of ground to cover. As I said, number one, there is no doubt here that the source of wrath in this chapter is heaven. If anyone doubts this, the announcement comes in a loud voice. 
I have pointed out to you time and again that Revelation repeatedly uses the word loud, if not loud, uses metaphors that, that relate to loud thunder, uh, sound of rushing waters, mighty wind. It's, heaven is broadcasting its message. Never stops. The problem with man is that we're on AM and God is broadcasting on FM. And God will not adjust his band or his frequency to us. We may adju must adjust to him. But heaven is bearing witness to God's existence and the reality of man needing a savior. And that, that you, you have to, and that's why the prince of the power of the air works so diligently to jam the signals. We saw in the last two or three wars when CNN and everybody was, was on the ground and we were watching it, the first thing we did was disrupt the communication capabilities of who we perceive to be our enemies. And that's exactly what our enemy Satan does. He tries to mess up the sound waves and confuse the messages. Now, if you missed Pastor Rock's message last week, I trust that you will go back and listen to it because he covered uh, the wrath of God as well as anybody is ever going to. I'm always amazed at how much he can say in such a short amount of time. But one of the, 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 the points that stood out for me in what he said last week is the wrath of God was never better exemplified than at the cross. The stroke, the wrath that was due you and me, Jesus took upon himself willingly and now stands as a substitute for any who put their faith in him. When we put our trust in Jesus, the wrath that was for us has been diverted. Not because we are worthy, but because he is worthy. And so the wrath has been diverted. However, not being in Christ leaves anyone not in him exposed to God's wrath. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you didn't hear that message, please go back and invest 30 minutes and catch up on what we talked about last week. Now, everything in the modern, much of the modern interpretation of Revelation wants to pull us into the future. And you see these, these bowls and you start to think environmental tragedy and nuclear holocaust. And there's so much material out there that if that's your bent or if that's where you want to research, you, you, can, you can go there online and find some pretty sound stuff and some pretty zany, cartoonish stuff as well. I, I'm going to leave that alone because if you've heard me in the past times that I've had an opportunity to share, I have said the revelation doesn't necessarily point us to the future, although it addresses the future in very general terms, but it more goes back into scripture to show that everything that was started in Genesis promised along the way has been fulfilled in Christ. And so notice, I want you just to consider these things. Now notice the similarity of these bowls to another narrative of God's wrath in the Old Testament, that being his ten plagues on the nation of Egypt. Here there are seven plagues or disasters all portrayed as being held in a bowl, a bowl that is easily managed, that is contained, that has parameters, that has definition, that God is holding, that God is controlling. Heavenly bowling. Now, there were ten plagues in Egypt. There are seven in Revelation. I don't see much difference in the numbers. We don't want to get into numerology. Seven and ten tend to be numbers of completion and fulfillment. What God does, he does to the full. He does well. He does it according to his own plan and predisposition. So I want to look at if, if Revelation is calling us back to remember that instance I want to look at three of the plagues in Egypt and see what happened to the people who were not of God and those who were God's people. So the first one is in Exodus chapter 8. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. But on that day I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. Now this was a picnic gone awry. This is, this is Riverview Park from hell. I mean, this is... <laughs> the, the, the flies were everywhere. Yet notice... 
God's control even over the insects, that he could tell the insects to go one place and stay away from another place. And of course, the differentiation was the people of God and the people not of God. And, and interesting, Pharaoh is on his way to the river that they worshipped. Every plague on Egypt was a mockery on what Egypt had made an idol of. Their frogs, their river, their firstborn, and God was confronting all of their idols to show that he alone was and is God and, and kept the delineation between his people and not his people so that not his people could see God's power and acknowledge his sovereignty and his rulership, which they refused to do. Now we go to the next chapter in Exodus. Exodus 9, it says, When Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was the land of Goshen where the Israelites were. Now, are you seeing, if, if Revelation is taking us back, it's not telling us to be fearful, it's telling us to remember how God has taken care of his people. And, and one, of the, one of the measuring rods I use for the interpretation of Revelation is what does it produce in your life? Because if it produces confusion, uncertainty, and fear then we have to question our point of starting, our starting point for the interpretation. Because God has not given us a spirit of? But of power and love and a sound mind. And perfect love casts out? So why would one of God's books promote and foster the very thing that God has set us free from? It makes no sense. Now let's go to Exodus 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky. And total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places they lived. God is able to preserve and protect his people. He has all power. Now, there were flies, thunder, lightning, sores, hail, darkness. God was in control of it all. This isn't the only example. We have Elijah in the midst of a drought. God sends ravens to feed him, puts him by a brook to meet his needs for water. When the brook runs dry, it's because God, only because God wants to move him someplace else. He goes to the widow supernaturally supplies the widow's household's needs so they can supply Elijah's needs. Oh, God is capable and able of taking care of his own. That's why you never heard the words come out of my mouth over the last five years, a bad economy. <laughs> it's a bad economy if you live in it. But we live in a transcendent economy. We live in an economy where God controls the money supply. We live in an economy that has rules that if you give, you will have in abundance. It, it, it's, it's, my, my faith isn't in Wall Street. It isn't in Washington. It isn't in a political party or a right philosophy and, and of, of, of how to do things. It's in God. And God is able to preserve his people in the midst of any bowl he happens to be pouring out. Not because we are worthy, not because we are smart, but because of Jesus. And to me, that's the message of Revelation. The, the, the Lamb's on the throne. Pastor Blaine has that next week, and I think he's, he's already got some great insight into that. So point number three. Now, when all these bowls, when all this happens, the accusation against God when wrath comes is that he's not just or fair. 
Now, this chapter goes out of its way to declare that God is indeed just, for they are in some sense, the bulls, a matter of reaping and sowing. Because they have persecuted God's people, God will now visit on the persecutors his judgment, his wrath. Now, he's not literally going to make them drink blood. Again, Revelation is painting graphic pictures to stimulate our imagination to get a general message across. When Revelation wants to be literal, it can be literal. It did it in this chapter. It said, you know what the three spirits are? They're demonic spirits that seem to do great things, but they're deceiving the people. It, it tells us. Everything else it doesn't tell us. Be careful. Don't force some interpretation on something that was never meant to be interpreted any more than we should interpret the details in parables to mean what they were never intended to be. They're part of a larger story with a moral or a lesson attached to it. See, the problem with man's justice is it's always based on limited and imperfect knowledge, sinful perspectives, fallen emotions, and even personal prejudice. Now, last night we saw something late at night. A, a, a verdict was declared. And it was so fascinating to me that you had people, all people standing in a parking lot watching the same thing, beholding the same evidence, and one group said one thing, and another group said another thing. One group was happy, another group was sad, angry. And even as I start talking about this, some of you are watching me to see what I will say. <laughs> and if it's not according to what you believe should have happened, I will hear from you, except many of you don't email, and that's the way I generally communicate, so I'm safe. But my point is, everybody will evaluate that from our human limited experience that is certainly colored or affected by our past experience. God is free from all that. God, God is free from personal preference or prejudice. He is pure. He is holy. And heaven goes out of its way to endorse what God is doing to say it's just, it's right, it's holy, and it's true. And we are always best to step out of our culture and into kingdom culture when we have to evaluate issues of justice and fairness. And so I leave it in God's hands. I don't know. You don't know. But one day we will all know and be known. And I'll leave it with him. Now... These calamities, whatever they are, and again, we're a lot of people out there interpreting, and it's going to be this, and it's nuclear, and it's environmental, and, and you know, these calamities, whatever they may represent, are not pure wrath, but also the work of God's grace. You say, oh, I don't, how? Notice that the hope is the people will repent after they experience and survive God's work. In fact, heaven is almost surprised. Still, this happens, and still they don't acknowledge God's power? They shake their fist in God's face, the very one who could save them? 9-11, apocalyptic happening. We're all going about our business. Suddenly, twin towers collapse. Thousands of people die. What happens? Our churches are filled. Not just on Sundays, noontime prayer. People turning to God because they realize their frailty, their fallibility, that we are not guaranteed tomorrow. I was on a cruise, teaching on a cruise, and I met a woman who met the Lord because of 9-11. Her husband was killed in the collapse of one of the towers. She was in the mall at Christmas time, going crazy, close to a nervous breakdown. Somebody gives her a track. She grabs it. She runs out to the car, not intending to read it, gets out there screaming and crying out, reads the track, and comes to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Steps back now in her life and sees the collapse of those towers in a whole different perspective than she had before she was in Christ. Amen. See, God wants to take us higher. The higher you go, the better the view. If you get hung up in the trees of Revelation, you won't see the forest of God's purpose. You want to start identifying the trees 
And it's not important. Now, the, it's so interesting here that Jesus, who's giving the revelation, now inserts some of his own words that he spoke on earth that are recorded in his Gospels. When he said, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. These were Jesus' exact words to his disciples. And remember, Revelation explains that all God's promises have been fulfilled. His words are true, and the future is under his control. Now, brothers and sisters, that's the nature of our existence here on earth. Whether it's, it's the big end or whether it's your end, we don't know when it is. When, and I, I travel, and I've traveled three and a half million miles, but almost every time I take a long trip, I tell my family, I, if I don't come back, I'll see you again someday. Carry on. Know that I gave my life to what I love. And I have no regrets. Because I'm not guaranteed. Neither are you. That's why the best thing you can do is not to figure out what the sea of blood is, but to be ready. And the readiness is not just holiness. See, if we've got this truth, if we are in the end times, then we need to be sharing the gospel. We've got the lifeboats, and they're not full. And if we're not careful, if you saw Titanic, we'll be as guilty as they were of, of, of paddling away from those who were crying out for help. If you believe it's the end, sincerely believe it. Why do you have a savings account? Why are you so uptight about which party votes for Social Security? It's going to be over soon anyway. Amen. Now, we need to operate with that fervor, with that because we need to be ready because Jesus is going to come like a thief. We don't know. Matthew 24, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Now it's interesting to me, the more predictions we make, that can't be a time when we expect him. <laughs> it's futile. But what's our response? Be ready. Lifeboats ready, supplies ready, message ready, destination ready, drills done over and over again. We are a people prepared. And we declare the message to those who have not heard, who have heard and have not responded, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You don't build a bigger basement and store more food. Do you think if you're the only one with food on your street that you're going to get to keep it? <laughs> don't worry, honey. We've got six months' food. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> Not when the family shows up, you don't. They're going to come take it. And you ain't got enough bullets to stop them. Silly. Silly. It's fear-based. If God can protect his people in Egypt, he can take care of you and me. Now, Armageddon. <whistles> Lots been done. With the only me mention of Armageddon in Scripture, be careful not to build a full-blown doctrine on something that's mentioned in the last verses of Scripture and is given not much explanation. Be careful. Now, you want future... You can go online this afternoon and get the future. I want to give you something else to think about. Is Armageddon one final battle in the future? Or has that battle already been fought and won? Consider the two great earthquakes in the New Testament before you answer. There will be an ultimate victory of Christ when he returns and vanquishes all his foes. But that victory was secured in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew 27, let's put it up. 
At that moment, the curtain of the temple, this is when Jesus died, was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. They responded correctly. The earthquake caused them to realize who God is, who Jesus is. Go to Matthew 28, first two verses. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the, uh, at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. I don't, there's never been a greater earthquake than those earthquakes. Never been ones with greater implications. Never been ones more important for you and me. If the tsunami in Japan changed the earth axis by a few degrees or a few inches, those earthquakes changed creation for all the time and all eternity. Restored things to how God originally intended them to be. That's how powerful what Christ has done is. I don't care who the Antichrist is. You don't study the Antichrist when they, when, when they prepare people to, to identify money that is forged, they do not study forgeries. They study the real thing so that they are so familiar with the real thing when the forgery shows up, they can know just to look at it by its feel. It's not right. Study Christ. That's all you have to be worried about. <clears throat> and all the antis, and John said there are many antichrists that have been re re released You'll recognize them all. Oh, there may be some pretty subtle, but if your heart is right, God will protect you. If he can protect you from flies, he can protect you from the Antichrist. <laughs> you know, and, and, it, and it's just, you know, this is so corporate, but it, it comes down to our individual walk. And I woke up on a Monday and I was singing this song. I can't remember where I learned it. I looked online, I found the words. I couldn't find the title. I couldn't find an author. But, but it goes like this. He signed my deed with his atoning blood he ever lives to make his promise good when all the host of hell march in to make a second claim they all march out at the mention of his name they all march out at the mention of his name he ever lives to make his promise good Jesus said, I won't lose one. He's not going to ruin his record on you. You're not worth it. <laughs> God has already judged and poured out his wrath on all world systems, represented by Babylon, by Pharaoh, by Egypt. Pick the name. They're all the same. They're predictable. They have nothing new under the sun. They try to wipe out God and his people. They try to outlaw and legislate what God and can and cannot do. <laughs> They're all the same. Whether it's North Korea or Nebuchadnezzar. Whether it's Iran or Egypt. They're all the same. And the message to them is the same. God's already judged them. Those who are in league with the dragon and the beast, in other words, they have conspired against the Lord and his anointed one. God's response is laughter, ridicule, mockery, and scorn. Psalm 2 is one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament in all probability because Jesus taught his disciples when he came back from the dead, explaining who he was in terms of the Old Testament scriptures. He must have used Psalm 2 quite a bit. Let's put it up. Why do, let's read this together. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. 
The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Not I will, not I hope to if everything works out. He's there. The lamb is on the throne. He's there now. And he lives forever to maintain and oversee the promises that he has made. God is not nervous. The final outcome is not in doubt. Jesus, Jesus promised he would not lose even one entrusted to him. God is in control. We can rejoice and be glad and laugh with him as he considers and dismisses his enemies who will soon be no more. The point to remember is that sin released the wrath of God. But in Christ, the believer is not under wrath, but under God's grace and protection. And your response to the wrath that is and is to come to the heavenly bowling is be ready. Let's bow our heads.